Last week, I talked with Brian Gadawa about superheroes and the hero's journey and all that stuff. This week, we're going down the rabbit hole even further to talk about monomyth and the supernatural worldview and whether these ideas should make us more skeptical about the Bible. This is Tatooine Sons. It's true. It's true. All of it. What is the name of the Porg on the Millennium Falcon? Force is strong in my family. What do you think his name is? <laughs> it's a big moment. I am a Jedi, like my father before me. Maybe Turbis? Do or do not. There is no try. Turbis? Pablo, if you're listening to this live stream, that Porg's name is now Turbis. It's a good Star Wars name. We're not done yet. These guys recorded an awesome podcast called Tatooine Sons. Everybody was lit. Welcome to Tatooine Sons, the only fan podcast to name an official Star Wars creature and be endorsed by the writer-director of The Last Jedi, Ryan Johnson. We believe that pop culture is the mythology of this generation, that there is a story written on our souls, and these myths speak to that story. And that is why I am honored to be joined again this week by Brian Gadawa. As you learned, if you listened to part one of my interview last week, Brian Gadawa is an award-winning Hollywood screenwriter. He's known for films like To End All Wars, which starred Kiefer Sutherland, and also the film adaptation of Frank Peretti's The Visitation. Brian is also a controversial movie and culture blogger. He's an internationally known teacher on faith and worldviews and storytelling, and he authored Hollywood Worldviews, Watching Films with Wisdom and Discernment. He's also the author of this amazing and trippy Chronicles of the Nephilim series, which Samuel the Hutt and I have read uh, uh, most of, uh, in my case. Uh, His obsession with God and with movies and with uh, worldviews results in a theological storytelling that blows your mind while inspiring your soul. Now, the hero's journey that we talked about last week is foundational to epic storytelling across the generations in almost all cultures. But what about this other piece of it that uh, Joseph Campbell popularized called the monomyth? I asked Brian what it is and if it disproves the greater story found in the Christian Bible, as some suggest that it does. Well, I I wrote about that in my book because I studied Joseph Campbell when I was learning storytelling. And as a Christian, I was filtering it through my own worldview. And I think there's a a truth to the monomyth. Um, By the way, this is also what, uh, you know, Jordan Peterson talks about, Carl Jung and the, you know, the archetype, uh, the archetypes of the collective unconscious, right? And there's a truth to that too. I don't think it's the way they say it is. Um, But, but why can't they come up, why can't they sort of come upon a revelation of a truth even through their own different? twisted worldviews, right? I'm not saying Jordan Peterson's worldview is twisted because I, I do think that there's there's a lot of good in, in what he says, but more so the Joseph Campbell thing. And so my conclusion was that what he's calling the monomyth is what I've already mentioned, which is that, you know, uh, our, you know, Christian Christianity says that because we're creating an image of God, God, not, I think not only does he place that need inside of us, but embedded in the universe. In other words, this notion of messianic deliverance, so to speak, right? That itself, meaning we, you know, okay, all religions, all philosophies ultimately have three notions to them. Something's wrong, because you think, look about it, they're all talking about what's wrong, what's wrong? Well, we don't realize we're gods, or well, we're, we're you know, we don't realize the, the divine within, whatever, you know, uh, or well, Religious man is uh, is ty- ty- tyrants. We need to throw off oppression. Something's wrong with the world because things aren't the way they should be. We just all know this. And then, um, uh, and 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 there, how do you solve it? You know, William James said there's two two basic things like 
What's wrong with the world and how do you solve it? And that's basically what all religions answer, but all philosophies do too. And then of course, I would say there's a third element, which is like, how is everything, how do we, uh, you know, there's a redemption, something's wrong, how do you fix it? And then what's the ultimate end of all things? You know, that's the ultimate, what everyone's trying to answer. And so the monomyth, I think, is simply that expression of the embeddedness of God's created order within us, our need. Um, and so therefore, yes, there were messianic concepts long before Jesus came. You know, people think that, you know, oh, Christianity is, you know, relatively young. Lots of ancient religions taught all the same things he taught before. Well, not really, but there's a truth to that. Like C.S. Lewis talked about him. That's why C.S. Lewis to me was very influential in my life because that little famous paragraph that everyone has read over and over again, where, it, where Tolkien was, I think, just, you know, helping him realize that, well, the reason why there are all these myths of dying and rising gods, there should be because that's what God was planning on, on accomplishing. And he put it embedded within his creation. And then they came to fruition in actual history of Christ's resurrection, death and resurrection. And that doesn't make it the same as all the previous, because if we are all messed up, if humanity is twisted, well, we're going to, any truth we discover is going to be a twisted version. So all the messianic myths before Christ, they have some things true, right? But they're not ultimately, but, but the monomyth, what he's trying to find is what's, what's, what's common between all of them as if that is a universal uh, independent truth that exists apart from anything. It's like, no, no, that, that can only, you know, if you're going to claim that there's some universal transcendent, what is it rooted in? You can't root it in nothing. And that's why I argue, well, yeah, the, the monomyth kind of thing that you're talking about is the need for redemption embedded in creation. And that originates in a, you know, a, a personal infinite a mind, you know, um, that's design, that's not randomness. And so that's kind of how I see the monomyth, you know. So I, I drew a lot from Joseph Campbell. I, you know, I don't recommend him anymore. Um, I think there are better, you know, there are better books out there, better whatever uh, ways of explaining things. Like like Jordan Peters from Peterson, for example. You know, I love his understanding of story and redemption is just powerful. It's very Jungian. Uh, I don't agree with all of Jung, but there, he's got more. He's got more on target than I think. Um, uh, Joseph Campbell, Campbell ever had. And of course, um, uh, Jordan Peterson is, you know, very cl close to the kingdom of God, if not uh, within it already. Just, you know, his form of belief and understanding in, in Jesus may not be the same as evangelicals, but, um, uh, and I've heard, you know, I haven't kept up with him all the time, but I've heard some amazing, interesting things. I think that there, I think he probably has a real faith in Jesus as far as I can tell. Um, but nevertheless, regardless, it doesn't matter. Even before he did, he was promoting Christianity uh, because he saw it as the most powerful mythological expression of Yeah, truth. that's interesting because, you know, a lot of people will use the idea of the monomyth, and Campbell did this to some, uh, to a large extent, um, the idea of the monomyth to discredit the biblical story. Um, to relativize yeah, it. Yeah. And, and how does, how does, um, how, you, you know, you obviously believe very differently as, as we do. Um, how does it, it actually point towards the truth of the biblical story versus discrediting it? Yeah. Well, this is a very common thing. I, you know, I used to be afraid of myth many, many decades ago, uh, because, you know, you've got this notion of, well, myth is just made up stories. And like the more that Christianity sounds similar to other myths, maybe it's just a made up story. Oh, no. And of course, that's what like atheists try to do this. Oh, look. You know, zeitgeist. Oh, look, Jesus is just like Adonis and he's just like this and just like that. And it's like, you know, that used to, oh, every culture has a flood myth. Don't you see? But you have to realize that there's a difference between facts and interpretation. And it's like, th there could be a fact that, you know, every culture has a flood myth. Yeah, right. That's a fact. But that doesn't mean that, it doesn't mean that, well, therefore they all evolved out of someone, someone else's idea. In fact, even if they did all evolve, you have to go back to one original, right? And and to me, when you understand the the nature of mythology and how mythology embodies truth, you 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 don't have to be worried. You don't have to be frightened by it or afraid of it because you understand. No, no, no. If there really was a flood of some kind, it would make sense that everybody would have a different version story of it because we all know everybody. You know. Cultures all over the world right now don't agree on anything, right? And it, even, like one fact can happen, right? 
and everyone interprets it all differently. So why not in the ancient world as well? Therefore, uh, the monomyth notion uh, that used to be, in fact, I think people are more in line with this now. Uh, like you say, uh, comparative religions is what you're referring to. Comparative religions used to, uh, for many, many years had been the 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 means by which you relativize the exclusivity or uniqueness of something like Christianity. But the problem is, as we come to understand mythology more now, um, no, it's actually the opposite. Uh, it's actually um, all all f- mythology reflects something universal truth. But the question is, which one is that, or what is that really? And the Christian claim is. Ours is the ultimate universal truth that everyone else is trying to get right. And fair enough, you can argue with that. No, you're not. You everyone, but, but to just say, well, everybody else thinks they're right too, that, that, that's not an argument because you could do that about any political issue now. Well, you believe, uh, you know, you, you, uh, you believe in abortion. Well, lots of people don't. It's like, well, what does that, what does that prove? You know, um, it, it, the fact that there's, there's, uh, similarity and differences. Uh, is a much more nuanced, complex reality. And the similarities make you, you, so you can have two different worldviews, evolution, an evolutionary worldview, say, and a, um, you know, whatever, maybe a creation worldview. And I'm not talking about young earth creation. Or I'm just saying evolution versus like um, transcendence. All right. And and you look at the same fact and you say, well, yeah, okay, it's possible. If you believe everything evolves out of everything, it makes sense that you would conclude because of your preconceived biases, oh, well, if there's many different earth myths, uh, I'm sorry, um, many different um, hero myths or many different flood myths, then they must have all evolved out of, you know, and that's the goal is to trace it back to find out where they evolved from. It's like, no, that's not necessarily true because if something really happened from a transcendence perspective, it it's it actually is more reasonable to me to think that if something happened, and I'm not saying the flood happened exactly the way we think it may have happened. I'm just saying, uh, or the notion of hero hero's journey or hero's myth, uh, the similarities similarities express not necessarily evolutionary connection, but intrinsic transcendent reality. And you can see how opposing worldviews will take the same fact and interpret it differently. And that's why, to me, I like. I'm like, oh yeah, monomyth. Yeah, I get it. Oh yeah, a collective unconscious archetypes. Let's put it that way. But but it's not a collective unconscious because that's a meaningless God substitute. But it's like, it makes sense if there is a transcendent God who created all of reality. It makes sense that we would all come up with different versions of our own, of the of the truth because, uh, you know, uh, like I said, any, any historical event that happens nowadays, you hear like 20 different interpretations and they're all opposite. So it's like, it would make sense that if something happens, you're going to have different interpretations and that's okay. And the goal still is to find, well, what is the truth? What is the truth the way it really happened? And of course, that's where the Christian claim um, comes in and says, okay, the reason we're not just arbitrarily saying, no, our version of the hero's story, which by the way, Jesus embodied the hero's story. Uh, and what I'm saying is, it's not that he submitted to some other trans- thing transcendent of him, greater than him, like the some humanistic concept. But no, no, that's the embeddedness where, yeah, he embodied that hero's journey because that's what God, how God created reality and and uh, our storied universe. So, so it would make sense he would he would also live that out in that in that sense, right? So, yeah, I I, I just think that. Uh, that myth, the mythology is no longer a powerful argument against Christianity because people are seeing it doesn't relativize everything. It actually sort of points to um, a, a truth that we're still, we still have to argue for. Okay, well, how do we still have to prove? Okay, why do we think Christianity is the most pure form of that truth? Fair enough. But uh, it's relativization doesn't work anymore in my mind in, in terms of the real political discussion, not political, the real. <laughs> philosophical discussion. Mm-hmm. Um, you talked a lot about, you use the phrase worldview um, and, and um, you've written about worldview extensively, both in your fiction and in your nonfiction. But, but what's interesting about it is it's this idea um, in a lot of ways of this supernatural worldview, especially of the, of scripture um, and of the Bible. Um, what is this viewpoint of the Bible and why is it um, honestly, kind of controversial even within Christianity to, to, for a lot of people. Yeah. 
look, it's controversy to me. Um, <laughs> as a Christian, I, um, you know, I mean, I've been very, we're all, we're all to a certain degree a product of our culture. And I've been heavily f- affected by anti supernaturalism, just like our, you know, because of, uh, you know, the, the onset of science, which is, you know, legitimate, but it also becomes a god and starts to consume everything else and dump, you know, t- tyrannize everything else. It's one form of knowledge that ends up trying to be all forms of knowledge, right? Uh, but nonetheless, you know, even as a Christian, I, I can see we've been very affected by anti supernaturalism, whether we believe so or not. But as I, st- but as a Christian, I'm also committed to. I believe the Bible is God's word. And so, and God's word it knows a little bit more about reality and truth than I do. So I tend to, if I discover something that the Bible's saying, even if it doesn't make sense to me, or even if it's like, well, that's not what I thought, I, I will go, I will, you know, go with the Bible because that's God's revealing to us. Now, it doesn't mean I always understand it fully, you know. So because I have that, my, my, understanding of truth is is grounded in revelation from God, or we can't know anything at all. That's another discussion, but um, it doesn't mean that the Bible says all knowledge there's to know. No, but it does have all the pr- proper presuppositions in order to uh, make, in, uh, uh, make our understanding of knowledge intelligible at all. So, um, therefore, as I read the Bible, I do see clearly a supernatural, obviously supernatural stories. Now, it doesn't mean that it's, that it's the way it's depicted in our English translations, because we also have to understand that, uh, language and cultures do evolve over time and change. And we're removed thousands of years from a lot of the cultural language. And what I'm getting at is a lot of times we interpret things scientifically in ancient texts that are meant to be poetic, you know? Um, so, so for example, there, there are very clearly things in the Bible, you know, like prophecies that talk about, you know, the, the sky rolling up like a scroll, the stars falling. And um, I think it's actually the liberal mindset that interprets that literally. Many Christians think that, oh, it's, it's liberal to interpret that language symbolically because that's liberalism but no it's the opposite because uh, interpreting it literally is not what it was intended in in the context of the ancient world and the bible that language you know and i've done lots of writing on this as well it was intended to be symbolic of you know spiritual truths right but that doesn't mean everything is and it's this all or nothing thing people you know you you argue for something like the, you know, you might argue for something literal, like Jesus Christ's resurrection is literal. And uh, you take everything literally, you know, and then what about this? And they point to some symbolism. Well, yeah, there's some symbolism or the opposite. You know, you try to point out some something symbolic in the Bible and some hyper literal Christians are like, you're saying everything's symbolic. Therefore, it's all myth. It's like, no, no, no. It's both and and you got to figure out what's what. You know, give me a break. So um, what I'm getting at there is that, in, you know, so, so we have to accurately sort of exegete what, you know, what is being said here and stuff. And some of these spiritual things in the Bible, I think are, are embedded within the cultural context, but we don't necessarily pick it up. And what I'm getting at is, is that apart from the angels and demons, you know, which, you know, that's most people agree. Yeah. Yeah. There's angels and demons in the Bible and whatever level you, you believe in that, you know, um, but I think there's a bigger picture as well of what's something of a spiritual realm that's going on with principalities and powers. And and the Bible talks about this, but it does talk about it in a way that we don't pick it up reading the English translations with our modern scientific mindset. So it talks about like, you know, uh, Psalm 82, you know, that God sits in the council of the gods. And it's like, okay, oh, we, we don't want to be polytheists. So we got, we must reinterpret that to mean, oh, the gods are human beings, uh, rulers or something like that. But if you study the concept of the divine council throughout the text of scripture, no, no, no. The word gods in the Bible is actually not the way we understand it to be. It's simply a word that describes the spiritual realm and the beings that are in it. So some, you know, a, um, God is called a God. Um, uh, demons are sometimes called gods. Um, uh, divine angels are called gods, and even a, a spirit of uh, Samuel is called a god, right? That doesn't mean they're gods who create like God, like Yahweh. No, no, no. It means that these are beings that exist in that spiritual realm. But but we have this sort of bias that word gods, so that if we if we say the word gods as if they really exist, we're poly we're being polytheists. We're being poly. No, no, no. That's not how the ancient. 
we are determined so much by our modern culture, but the ancients didn't think that way. So knowing this and starting to explore, well, what did, what were these God beings, you know, these divine, you know, if you want to use the term divine beings, that's okay too, because that more spiritual beings, that's fine. Um, but I discovered that and to this day, you know, it, it shocked me because I, you know, I tend to, I tend to have a biblical view that's quite simple and, you know, God's in control of all things. And it makes sense to me that if God is sovereign and, you know, he's in control and stuff, it's like, why would he need other people to do things for him? You know, that's kind of sounds like, uh, you know, like maybe he's not capable. But when I, dis- when I studied it and realized, no, there, there is a heavenly host of divine beings in the Bible that do God's will and they go out and do his purposes Okay, I had to accept that it didn't jive with my understanding of God being, you know, so sovereign that he didn't use anyone else to do his work, right? But it's like, no, no, he really does. And, and those spiritual beings exist. And there's also another element of that I won't go into, but that I, I go into in my novels, you know, and these spiritual beings have a certain kind of authority over parts of the, parts of the world. And it's just like, wow, this is really fascinating. So it, it's not the what I wanted to believe, and it and and even sometimes it sounds a lot like the mythology, and you and you're you're like oh, but if the Bible says it, at the end of the day, I believe it, and I've got to f- seek in my understanding to make sense of that, you know. And and again, atheists aren't gonna they're gonna laugh at that, they're gonna scorn that, but but as as a Christian. Um, Seeing that spiritual reality helped me to open my eyes. I've always believed, oh yeah, there's angels and demons, but I don't really interact with them. So I don't think much about them, right? But when I see this, well, there's a spiritual realm with these heavenly hosts and they're engaging in stuff in the Bible that has to do with what's going on in history. I'm like, wow, that's really unique. And so I wrote my novels, Chronicles of the Nephilim, Chronicles of the Watchers, Chronicles of the Apocalypse, all to retell biblical stories that I'm familiar with taking into account this this motif of these these watchers these divine beings the heavenly host and and how they play out behind the veiled curtain of the spiritual world you know and you know the bible gives us little glimpses occasionally you know like we get a glimpse into the throne room of god right but and 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 sometimes it describes an event like in what is it kings second kings 22 or uh with mike what is it second uh First Kings 22 and Micaiah, you know, he, he sees this vision and how God tells, Oh, I'll send a lying spirit. And then they go out and do it. And it's like, Oh yeah, that's, that's, that's how God does some things, you know? And, um, and I wanted to, to understand the historical stories of the Bible with pulling back that curtain. And so I, I used my imagination to, because we can't, we don't, we can't see the spiritual world, right? And we only have little glimpses in the Bible. But I thought, well, what might that look like if that was, if there's a heavenly realm that's connected to the earthly realm, like the Bible talks about, like, right? Because it talks about when there's a war on earth, there's a war in heaven. What is that? Oh, so there's like, so there's like connections and, and it also talks about, you know, most people acknowledge, you know, there's, there are uh, like in Daniel, right? There's like these, these princes over nations, these spiritual prince over Persia. So there's a heavenly, I'm sorry, there's an earthly pr- king of Persia and then there's a heavenly prince of Persia over him and they're connected in some way. That's fascinating. So I, um, I wrote, you know, I've got like, I don't know, 20 novels now that just, it was a, it was a change. Even as a Christian, it, it opened my mind to be challenged to see the world more supernaturally. Now, this doesn't mean that I think there are demons of lust running, you know, and demons behind bushes. And, and I, I don't believe that there's, you know, watchers now over, you know, I, I believe a lot of that was summed up in Messiah. When Jesus came as Messiah, I think he, he, he wrapped up a lot of that stuff, but nonetheless, it's there. And, and, um, uh, and, and, and I think that it, op- it opens, it opens our eyes to considering the supernatural reality behind our natural world. Last fall, I was speaking at a church here in Alabama. Uh, Another guest uh, that evening uh, was a missionary uh, to the indigenous people of Peru. The particular tribes that he works with have no written language, so everything they learn is passed down verbally from generation to generation to generation. And during um, a meeting that he had um, with some of these indigenous people, one of them 
began telling uh, the missionary a story that had been passed down among his people for what he said is thousands of years. It told of a time when the tribe had rebelled against their God and become terribly evil. And that God brought judgment down on the tribe by flooding the earth, destroying the whole tribe, save one family. The missionary explained that this story was written down thousands of years ago, all the way on the other side of the earth. And while some might suggest that this discredits the Bible, it's just as easy to argue that this actually proves a common source for all of these stories. My interview with Brian will continue in just a moment, but I want to take just a minute to thank our sponsor, Cufflinks.com. If you're not familiar with Cufflinks.com, all you need to know is that they have over 3,000 items, including Cufflinks, ties, tie bars, and socks from all of the fandoms that you love, like Star Wars and Star Trek and Marvel and DC and Lord of the Rings and much more. Um, You already know this. We love Cufflinks.com. They're family owned. They're run by a couple of brothers who geek out about Star Wars as much as we do. So if you want to help the show out and you want to look great doing it, um, you want to become a sharp dressed fan, head on over to Cufflinks.com. Take a look at everything it has to offer. Be sure to use the code Tatooine15 at checkout and you'll receive 15% off your entire order. Um, and if you're a Georgia Bulldog fan, then you've got they've got some really cool items on there to celebrate their once in every four decades football national championship. But anyway, uh, Brian is known uh, for his really out there, controversial perspectives on the Christian scriptures. And as I continued my interview with him, I asked him to explain his perspective and why he approaches the Bible this way. It's funny because, um, yeah, it is a particularly modern and postmodern construct to de- to actually uh, organize history into the notion of like pre-modern, modern, and postmodern. It's a way of categorizing. It's fine, but but if you understand what's going on, if to actually to actually categorize the past as, oh, that's when they were all ignorant and didn't know anything about science. It's like, no, that's ignorance itself. Because, you know, even in Egypt, which I've been, you know, my latest novel is Moses. So I've been studying Egypt and like, you know, yeah, they did believe that there was, you know, they believed in incantations and, and enchantments and that words had power and they believed in magic. In other words, what we understand as magic. But at the same time, they made a differentiation between what they knew and understood is like, no, that's an earthly sickness. That's epilepsy, just like the Bible did too. You know, so the, my point is the ancient world definitely did have an understanding of the difference between some spiritual maladies and some physical maladies. Granted, they would engulf more into the spiritual than we would. Okay. I understand that. And the notion is the natural starts to eat up the supernatural and how, why can't it just go all the way and eat it all up? Right. But if you understand just from a, from a, uh, a basic philosophical sense, like if reality is, does consist of both a physical and a non-physical component, then there's going to be different forms of knowledge and understanding in those and that they don't cancel each other out, but you have to, you have to come up with a philosophy that integrates them, not that separates them and destroy one in the name of the other. That's the most ignorance of all actually. And so to me, it's, it's, it's a, it's an almost, you don't even have to be s- Christian spiritual person to believe that there's a physical and a non-physical world because if you appeal to, you know, physicalism and materialism is a com is a popular thing now, you know, but it's just ridiculous because it's like logic is not physical folks. And if you believe it's real and it, and it determines truth, you can't use it if it's not physical, you can't believe in it if it's not physical. So therefore, you know, so if there's logic and, you know, and science itself, you know, you, you empiricism, you know, the future will be like the past. Dave Hume, you know, saw, you know, proved this already. You know, he's, his skepticism has never been answered by godless men. They think they do, but they haven't. And that is how, if you don't have a transcendent reality that you know is uniformity of nature and stuff, how do you know the future will be like the past? And you don't, you don't without, a, I would argue without a Christian God. And, and, um, and, and so my point here is, is that, uh, in, in, in a most basic, honest way, it's like, yeah, there's a, there's a physical world and a non-physical world. 
And so we need to understand how these two interact as well as how they're different, their similarities and their differences. And, and all that, that the spiritual supernatural word means is the non-physical, you know, um, well, I mean, you know, maybe you could make a distinction between logic, which is non-physical, and angels. I get, I get, but you you see what I'm saying is that that um, that's primal, primary, and then um, uh, so so it, just because you believe in spiritual and supernatural doesn't mean that you would have to reject science. And it's interesting because you know I would admit that the Christian Church does have a past history of of doing that. But uh, at times, and in certain ways, granted, um, you know, yeah, sure, there are some people who would say, you know, oh, that person is epile- a person who has epilepsy; they're possessed by a demon or something like that. You know, sure, there's extremes in every in every case, but you know, by and large, you just don't. Most Christians don't think in those terms. They, you know, they don't. And and um, uh, so, but but here's the funny thing: what I've seen is people who. Uh, worship science as a God, <laughs> you know, it's funny because I've seen them debate Christians, you know, whether it's, um, you know, these famous, you know, atheists like Daw- Dawkins and those guys, I hear them talk and they're, they talk religiously. They don't talk scientifically. Like they're talking about things that science doesn't, can't even address like the existence of God and all this stuff. It literally, if you understand science, you realize it can't address <laughs> these things. Right. And yet they're the ones who are trying to disprove God as if, as if you can, you know? And, and so when I hear, when I've heard debates between, you know, a, a, a modern day educated Christian and, and the science worshipers, I call them, you know, um, I often find that it's the Christian who's actually more scientific and it's the atheist who's being more religious because they're arguing about things that you are not scientific and the Christian's trying to stay scientific, you know? So, um, yeah, like this guy, you know, who's the, who's the guy who believes that the, everything came from nothing? You know, there's literally a, a book he wrote about that. I can't remember the guy's name, some, some scientist. And he's like trying to argue that like everything came from nothing. It's like, you really are trying to say that, you know, it's an and you know, the, uh, thesis, you know, yeah, it's like, but, it, but it, it's actually so contradictory. Like you literally can't, you can't right. propose that, you know, and so no, no, no. Well, you mean nothing, nothing or something, nothing. When you think <laughs> about it, it has to come from something, nothing, which really right. isn't nothing, which is nothing, but you, you listen and, and he's the kind of guy or the multiverses, right? You hear all this talk about multiverse and it's really popular. And by the way, I'm a storyteller. I realize it, I might even use it as a, as a concept, conceptual tool to tell an interesting story. I won't deny that it has some potential there, but uh, it, f- it's fundamentally not very satisfying to me because um, uh, the multiverse thing is, it's, it's vogue in scientific circles, but it's, there's no science to it There's because you can't verify anything. So it's all philosophical. And so, and I'm, but I'm okay with that, but at least let's acknowledge what it is. It's religion. It's not science, you know? And, uh, but that's the funny thing about it. Like just because scientists are saying something, they automatically label it as science, right? And it's like, well, you know, Fauci has lied so oftentimes just because Fauci says something doesn't mean it's actually science, folks. In fact, usually it's lies. So, you know, this is the nature of humanity. Just because a scientist says something doesn't make it science. And what I've found is that's the case is oftentimes they're being more philosophical because they too are homo religicus. That was the word I started out in the beginning <laughs> saying homo spiritualicus. It's homo religicus. Okay. We are all religious beings, even the atheists, and they don't like that, but it's true. Hmm. How does having a supernatural, this will be the last question. How does um, having a supernatural worldview uh, help make our uh, make sense of our lives? Uh, I think it's fundamentally rooted in transcendence. Supernatural is, in its most primal sense, pointing to a transcendent reality that gives our present reality uh, meaning, but not only present reality, but uh, ongoing reality. If all there is is this world, then nothing has meaning. Everything is absurd. Your your belief in love, your belief in truth, it's just spasm, physical spasms, and fantasy delusions, because there is no truth, there is no love, there is nothing, because it's everything just dies and doesn't exist. And um, so, so the the supernatural worldview, uh, admittedly, there are a lot of kooks, a lot of Christian kooks. In fact, I know because the books that I write, 
Uh, I write about Nephilim, these giants in the Bible and stuff that sounds wild and, and <laughs> I admit it. And, and I will admit that there's a lot of Christians that take that stuff to a bizarre extreme where it's just like, it's not biblical in my opinion, but they are Christians and they're, they, they believe anything that, anything that claims to be supernatural. So they start, like they start believing pagan books. They start believing, um, any legend or myth, uh, any non-biblical source, I use non-biblical sources like the Book of Enoch and Pseudepigrapha. I use them as sources for interesting storytelling. I'm not claiming their scripture or anything like that. But some people start to believe that all this stuff, everything that's said in all these religious, it's all real. And they become so extreme. And I'll admit, that's what that's the extreme of what supernatural can be. But hey, look, materialist worldview can have extremes too, right? Where people are like, basically the serial killer is murdering people because there's no meaning and purpose and you can't judge it, right? So it's like, you know, you can ex get extremes in everything, including the supernatural worldview. But what it what it does, what I think it, the positive that it, it helps is to, um, for you to, to find that transcendent, that transcendence that gives meaning that we are all searching for. We're all searching for significance in some way. And the supernatural provides a doorway because ultimately my, my argument is just, uh, God is the only, the only origin of all meaning and purpose and, and transcendence. But the supernatural is that doorway that opens up to finding him, I would say, right? I don't think it's not everything to me. You know, I write about angels and demons and watchers and stuff like that. But it's like, to me, it's all about God, Jesus and his resurrection, but Yahweh as my creator, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as my father, my shepherd, my God, my creator, my sustainer, redeemer. That's what everything's all about for me. But the supernatural, which I think a lot, a lot of Christians become obsessed with, I think it should be the doorway that opens us to understanding and connecting more with our God because – like I said, I have felt in my own life the effect of a modernist worldview, even though I reject it as a Christian, like, you know, the modernism might be something along the lines of, you know, science and re rationality are the only ways of knowing truth. Um, that's what modernity brings and it rejects the supernatural. But there's a, but there's a truth to reason and a truth to science that does um, um, uh, qualify and limit religious beliefs in a good way, right? To a certain degree. And I believe that. But I too have felt the power of the naturalism eating up this supernaturalism to the point where you start to, and I've heard this term before too, you know, you, you're a practical atheist. You can be a Christian believing in God, but you're living a practical atheist life. And that doesn't mean you have to run around saying you're demon possessed by things or, you know, well, the Lord told me this, you know, because I'm not in that camp. I don't believe God speaks to us and all that stuff. So there's this balance going on there between the supernatural and the natural. Let me see if I can take a shot at explaining what I think Brian was trying to say there at the end. Um, the supernatural worldview tends to get a bad rap because of the insanity of certain people who take it way to the extreme. Um, I mean, lots of us have seen the video of that Christian teacher on that TV show claiming that a demon uh, impersonated her husband and tried to have sex with her. That's not uh, the supernatural worldview approach that Brian is talking about here. The supernatural worldview is about believing that there is something bigger going on than only what we can see and hear and taste and touch. There is another realm. There is life after death. We know this. When a family member dies, we naturally want to believe they're, they, that they're in a better place. That doesn't happen because of some natural explanation. It happens because we have eternity written on our hearts. I want to thank Brian for joining me this week and make sure you check out Godawa.com where you can learn about his books and everything else he's got going on. I promise his fiction writing is some of the best that you're going for ever going to read. And uh, I want to thank you for listening to Tatooine Sons, a pop culture podcast. If you enjoyed this interview, please take a moment to rate and review the show on your podcast app of choice. Make sure you hit that follow or subscribe button on your app so that you get every episode the moment it drops. Our next episode is going to release on Tuesday, and we'll be reacting to all those hot rod motorcycles, Vespa thingamajigs in Chapter 3 of The Mandalorian, and reviewing Season 2, Episode 1 of Superman and Lois, which 
Uh, spoiler, it's fantastic. And then I'm going to give us kind of a quick entry-level understanding into the character of Moon Knight. So whenever that series decides to drop, hopefully soon, we'll all be prepared for it. Uh, make sure you follow Tatooine Sons on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Share this episode with somebody else. That's how you help the show grow. Um, that's going to do it for today. There's only one thing left to say. May the force be with you, always. This party's over. I like that Wookiee. Don't get technical with me.